Let's do it. Yeah. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. I was once described as the manager, the mentor, and the visionary who went to the theater with an unfocused dilettante and raised the curtain on a superstar. Hello and welcome to episode 29 in our series exploring the history of the management rights company Main Man, renowned in the 70s for transforming the business side of rock and roll. While allowing Main Man artists to explore their creative freedom, the company pioneered promotion and marketing techniques that became synonymous with the decadence, extravagance and indulgences that are now part of rock folklore. I feel very privileged to have participated politically, socially, culturally, morally, psychedelically in this sense of enlightenment and liberation. I think it really pushed boundaries in a way. Main Man worked with a very diverse range of clients that included Amanda Lear, Cindy Bullens, Mick Ronson, John Mellencamp, Mop the Hoople, Dana Gillespie, Mick Ralphs, Iggy Pop, David Bowie and Lou Reed. The thing with Rono is I could very rarely understand a word he said. He had a hull accent. He'd have to repeat things five times. But a really sweet guy. Great guitar player, really sweet guy. In this episode, from the Main Man archive, you'll be hearing from one of the great Main Man characters who first met David and Angie Bowie and Tony DeFries at the London season of Andy Warhol's Pork in the summer of 1971. And when the main man office opened in New York the following year, Lee was appointed the company's vice president. Lee was a great photographer and also had a flair for promotions, so fitted in perfectly with what he called the New York misfits and weirdos, which he documented for many years. Lee arrived in New York from Kentucky in the late 60s looking for adventure. He fell in love with the underground art world and never left, living in New York for the rest of his life. Lee was in Los Angeles in 2014 for a launch party for his book of photographs, Drag Queens, Rent Boys, Pickpockets, Junkies, Rockstars and Punks, when he died unexpectedly. From an interview recorded just before his death, here's Lee first of all recalling when he first heard about the man he'd end up working very closely with. Uh, the first time was so strange because I just was thumbing through Rolling Stone magazine back when it was cool, and um, there was a little article by John Mendelson about this peculiar guy who wore dresses when he performed, but he wasn't a drag queen. He just wore dresses. And I thought that was very interesting because we were working in underground theater at that time for Warhol and for John Vaccaro and people like that. And we did a lot of that kind of stuff, too, where people just wore whatever they wore. And often it was men in dresses with beards and all that kind of stuff. Then when I went over to London to do pork for Andy Warhol, Cherry Vanilla and I were pretending to be journalists so we could get into all the rock and roll shows. And so we got, oh, we just got into everywhere, Rod Stewart and Mark Bolin and all those people, because they believed us. They thought we were real because we were American, we were loud, and we could throw the Warhol name around. And so I saw that David Bowie was playing at a little club called the Country Club on Haverstock Hill Road. And I said, let's go there to Cherry. And she said, who's he? And I said, I don't know who he is, but he wears dresses, so let's go. So me and Wayne County and Cherry Vanilla went to see him there. And he wasn't wearing a dress. He was wearing a big floppy hat and big old bell-bottom pants. And so we were disappointed in that respect. But I eventually, I mean, that's how I first ever heard about him. I know Rodney Bingenheimer and Ultraviolet and people like that had met him before. But I didn't know that then. And so I was very impressed with him. He was very courtly and very kind and nice. His wife, Angie, was very loud and raucous and boisterous and that's what drew us into their circle. She was so incredible and just devil may care and so we went off to um, that bar on Kensington High Street and we would just dance the night away and that's all I thought it was ever going to be and it was good fun then and they came to see our show and everything and then a year later the show had closed. We'd all gone back to America and resumed our previously abnormal lives. I was working at 16 Magazine then, and um, suddenly there was the call from them saying, we're coming to America and we want all of you to work for us. And that's how we all hooked up all of a sudden. 
We've heard from Tony Zanetta in the early episodes of this series how he came to be part of Warhol's Pork Project, which had a huge impact on David. Here's how Lee became involved with the show. Well, we'd been doing underground theatre for a few years, and in it there was a lot of simulated sex, not real sex, strange kind of things. Jane County wrote a play once called World, Birth of a Nation, where a guy peed in a paper cup on stage and then drank it and said, oh my God, I've discovered the fountain of youth. It was that out of control. Actually, it was World Birth of a Nation that Andy Warhol used to come to. He came to it every night, and he loved it, and he loved its irreverence and its craziness. So then he approached Tony Ingrassia, uh, the director, and he said, I've been recording. And what he'd been, remember in those days, all this kind of stuff like recording and being able to tape off your telephone and everything was all completely new. Andy would go around with a little tape recorder and he would record every, on a cassette. He would record everything that anyone said to him. He didn't care what it was. And so he said to Tony and Grassi, I have hundreds and hundreds of tapes. I'm sure you'd like them. Would you like to turn them into a play? Well, it was Andy Warhol. So Tony and Grassi said, great. Well, boxes and boxes of tapes arrived. Little cassettes. Remember how tiny they were? Well, thousands of them with the most boring stuff on them. And so it was left to Tony to turn it into something that sort of was like a play. And he was he really worked on it, and he turned it into this great comedy, a lot of scatological jokes, a lot of drag queen jokes, a lot of sex and everything. And he turned it into this play called Pork, which had no plot. It was just about all these fictional characters which were thinly disguised. Andy Warhol's character was called B as opposed to A. Viva was played by Wayne County. Her character was changed into Bulba. And uh, Pork was Bridget Polk. And Cherry Vanilla played that role. And I was assistant director, which was a fabulous thing to be because I got to just watch it all happen and develop as it happened. So we, we played it in New York, and we thought that would be that. And then this strange art collector guy said, bring it to London. And that's what changed, I think, changed a lot of people's lives, you know, because we went there not knowing what was going to happen. We created sensations. Jerry Miller got arrested for popping her tits out in front of the Queen Mother's house. People picketed the show, saying it was immoral, and and we didn't know anything about British tabloid press. Coming from Warhol's studio in New York, the cast of Pork not only acted outrageous, they looked outrageous, using techniques that not many people in the UK were familiar with at the time. This was before Crazy Colour or Manic Panic or any of that. So we would colour our hair with shoe dye. And me and Wayne County and Cherry Vanilla would just go and get, you could get these spray cans of shoe dye and you could color your hair. And so I don't remember exactly. I was mostly bleach blonde and um, I had had my hair cut by that time into a DA, the rocker look. But it had like, I think shocking pink shot through it, real loud shocking pink was sprayed on it and maybe some other colors. And yeah, he was very intrigued and said, how do you do this? Can you do this to your hair and not have your hair fall out? And we said, basically, we don't care. And uh, I'm sure all of that did influence his deciding to take the leap into going ahead and just being really, really weird looking. The way rock and roll looked back then was really had gotten very boring. A lot of long hair, a lot of, um, because I was a photographer, so I was particularly aware of it because I had to take pictures of these people and you couldn't even get a picture of their faces because their hair was always hanging in the way. Everybody was just ugly. Meanwhile, we showed up in, in Pork and it wasn't just us. It was underground theater and everything. It was a lot of movement of where suddenly the hair was getting cut. It was made crazy. A lot of crazy makeup and everything was coming in. It was Jackie Curtis, who was a huge influence on David, wearing glitter and putting exotic and unusual and unexpected makeup on her face because she didn't care about looking like a woman. She just wanted to look crazy. And she dyed her hair that unnatural red color, Uh aha, 
and put glitter on her eyelids and glitter on her lips and bizarre makeup, held her clothes together with safety pins. And all of that was a huge influence, not only on David, but on all of rock and roll, as it turns out. She really, really said you could, oh, sprayed her shoes with spray paint, you know, sprayed her clothes with spray paint. People didn't know in those days that you could just do horrible things to your clothing and it didn't matter. You know, people were respectful of their clothes before then. She ripped them up and then put them back together with safety pins. She sprayed them with spray paint. She wrote on them with magic markers. No one did that before Jackie Curtis. Also, everyone was really poor. And the difference between America and England, and I don't know how it was a difference, but it was, is we were all broke. We got all our clothes out of garbage cans, and our clothes were basically like old curtains and tablecloths that we would then wrap around ourselves and safety pin them together. But we had Max's Kansas City where we could eat and drink for free and things. So we didn't turn it into any kind of political thing. We just turned it into a visual kind of we're crazy and this is the way life is. Maybe it was a hangover from the old uh, flower power days. Also, we were in New York, and so you can do anything you want to in New York and no one will bother you about it. So once the Ziggy Stardust album was released in the summer of 1972 and DeFries decided it was important to establish a base in New York, the cast of Pork were ideal staff to make an impact. The first office was on 57th Street, a little duplex, and it was uh, very, very informal at that time. Tony and his girlfriend, Melanie, lived upstairs, and then the office was downstairs. We showed up when we wanted to, and, and we basically, there, it was not, ever, nothing was ever run as an office. It was always run as an experiment. We had no pocket money, so, for example, we could not take taxis. We could only take limousines because taxis expected you to pay for them. We took limousines instead of taxis. We we stayed in hotels instead of, you know, cheaper places which would expect money. We'd stay in the best hotels because in those you could just sign away. And those days were, I mean, so much more innocent than that it is now. We, I mean, I upgraded once from the Chateau Marmont to the Beverly Hills Hotel. That's crazy. We weren't the office types, and and we didn't carry on as the office type. Main man was never operated in that way. And I've thought about that a lot, you know, um, because we knew nothing about the music business. Uh, We did underground theater. I was photographing rock and roll stars, which is my only connection with rock and roll. I knew nothing about how to sell it or market it or any of that kind of crap. And when I've thought about it, the greatest successes, when you think about it, like... um, Simon Napier Bell and Colonel Tom Parker and everything, none of them knew anything about the music business either. And Tony DeFries said to us, just go in, demand whatever I tell you to demand, don't back down, and we'll get it. And sure enough, it was right. Cherry Vanilla would just go into the halls of RCA Records, which was all very staid and proper. And a bis- I mean, it was a real business. They had a, their main money-making time at that was the Red Label, which was mostly like opera and stuff like that. And of course, they had Elvis and they had John Denver, so they didn't need us. And yet, we'd go in and demand all kinds of things, and we were so loud and obnoxious we always got them and then we just go away again and we didn't know how we got them we just got them from being there and because they had lots of money we had no money and so they just give it to us so we'd leave me and cherry vanilla we could just run rampant because i had bleach blonde hair she had scarlet red hair we dressed crazy and we were the demons and we would go in and just get things that's what the factory did the factory did pretend things there's a famous thing that once when I was really young and when I first met Andy Warhol and he said, well, what do you want to do? What do you do? And I said, well, I guess I want to be a photographer. And he said, well, then you're a photographer. And I said, well, I haven't had any lessons and I don't know anything. And he said, he pointed across the room at Candy Darling and he said, see her? And I said, yes. And he said, well, he says she's a woman. And so she is. And that's what you do. You just say whatever it is you are, and then that's what you are. Everyone will believe you. What the main man team were doing with Ziggy at the time was taking the things that David liked about the Warhol New York scene, adapting them, using what he'd been perfecting in Britain, and then launching the whole concept back on America. 
we were crazy. We did all those things with makeup, with our clothes, with our outrageousness, with our not caring about what society thought and everything. And then the next thing we knew, we were hired to work for ourselves because then they showed up looking like us. We were doing it to the point where we could do it, which was all we thought we were going to do with it ever. It's an old American thing, which I've learned since, is a lot of the more outrageous American acts need to go to Europe and especially England first to be able to be accepted if they're outrageous because America is very, very Republican, really. Doing underground theater was all we were going to do. And so he was able to take that in England because England's much more accepting and the rest of Europe also of new things and outrageous things. And they don't feel so threatened. I don't know why. I don't. It must be in the tea. Who knows what? But let me always go back to the fact that none of it would have worked if he didn't have something to offer. He couldn't just paint himself up and dance around. And this was the, what could be done in America. But as you know, if you look back actually on sales figures and everything, the New York Dolls, Iggy, even Alice Cooper didn't sell records for the longest time. They just kept on going and they had a terrific influence on what you could do and how far you could push the boundaries. Even Lou Reed didn't really sell records. But in the end, I mean, they've had their success and they've had it their way and they've had it on their terms. And David very much opened those doors for them. Whatever his motives were is unimportant now. We used to talk on those first tours, the first Ziggy tours in America. We would, because he didn't go out to do the club things and stuff that much. And so we'd sometimes sit like in his motel rooms and hotel rooms in strange places like Phoenix, Arizona and stuff. And he would tell me, he'd say, yes, I take from everything I see, but that's part of it. I know what to take. And that is, that's the way show business works. You know, you pick out what's great and you understand its greatness and then you fit it into your own what you're doing. Yeah, he stole from Edith Piaf, he stole from Jane County, he stole from... Oh, so many people, but is it stealing in show business? You know, it's, I guess if you're a stand-up comic and you steal a joke, it's stealing. But if you're just stealing concepts and approaches and stuff, it's just, it's everybody won in the end is what I'm saying. No one lost. Being the advance man for David and the band on that first US tour, Lee got to see firsthand how the Ziggy phenomena grew as the tour progressed. That's what surprised all of us, because the very first one was Cleveland, which is not really a redneck state, but we didn't know that then. Our lives were New York, L.A. if we were lucky, and London, because we'd done pork. We didn't know anything about that inside of America, so the first show was in Cleveland. So we were terrified about it, because as far as we knew, that was the Middle West, the Bible Belt, as far as we, it's not really, but we thought that then. It was a 5,000-seater place. We thought, well, that no one will come. By that time, Sarinda Fox was on the tour with us. Everybody joined the tour. It was like over 40 people in the entourage. And so Sarinda Fox and I went to stand at the back of the hall in Cleveland. It was totally sold out, filled up. David walked out. He was brilliant from the first note. The audience went crazy. And Sarinda and I looked at each other and said, oh, my God, they understand this in America. And it's true. We had some shows that didn't have big attendance in St. Louis. It was a 15,000 seat place and like uh, 300 people showed up. But, um, you know, that's what you do in show business. You play to who you've got. And David was very good at that. In St. Louis, he called all the people down, set them down right in front of the stage, sat on the edge of the stage, crossed his legs and basically did the show I'd seen him do in the country club in Haverstock Hill. And the audience loved it because it was intimate. First of all, we had the acceptance and the press, which was magnificently orchestrated by Tony DeFries and Cherry Vanilla. And America, like all kids, I mean, look at the new boy band that they're foisting on us now. It's so amazing to see. All you have to do is say, these boys are cute. And you actually look at them and you think, they're not cute. But it doesn't matter. If they say they're cute, they're cute. And the little girls go crazy. Well, see, he used to, at the end of the show, he would entice the audience to come down and leave their seats and mob the stage and touch his hand. Remember that? Reach out, touch me, whatever it was. Well, that doesn't work unless there's some hands there. 
And so he would entice the audience down. Well, there are various clubs, most clubs like that. It was the end of the show anyway. But in Chicago, they had Chicago. I mean, remember the Chicago riots and all that kind of stuff? They didn't like that idea. So there were all these cops and keeping the kids in their seat. And Angie just went and just started physically attacking the cops pushing them out of the way so the kids could get down there for the finale of the show. It was all show business. She had to have those kids down there. That was part of the show. And so the cops just, next thing I knew, I was sitting in my seat. I was staying out of it. I was in like the eighth row, and I was sitting there, and I saw Angie's legs up in the air as she was being carried upside down up the aisle by like these six uniformed cops. The kids went crazy. That's all it needed. And so the show ended the way it should have ended, the way Angie wanted it to end, with the kids going nuts, the cops going nuts, and and David getting to do Give Me Your Hands and getting the hands he needed to end the show. So by that time, we had the press going, and, you know, once again, we get back to the fact if there had been nothing there, there would have been nothing there, but there was. And the press gets the people there, and then David delivers the show, and bang, Bob's your uncle. But it took years. He didn't have a real hit until Young Americans. After the second leg of the US tour in April 1973, Lee was also part of the Ziggy team that went on to tour Japan. Oh, he loved the Japanese culture, and he loved the look of it. He gathered so much from it, and uh, Kensai Yamamoto with his fashions and everything. David wore those for the next year, those clothes that he designed for him, which were brilliant and fabulous. And yes, of course, the same thing happened in the last show in Tokyo. There were cops everywhere, and Angie once again instigated a riot. And the cops were overwhelmed by the kids who stormed the stage. But what we didn't know was the whole stage and everything around the stage was on a kind of an hydraulic lift thing. Because when they did their other stuff, like that kabuki and all, I don't know what it is, but the stage would need to go up and down and come back with new scenery and stuff. So it wasn't really a solid thing. It was on hydraulic lifts so when all those hundreds of kids were jumping up and down in time to music that's the thing that that really does it if they were jumping randomly but they were doing it like a pile driver they broke the hydraulic lifts and the whole stage began to collapse we got in a lot of trouble for that they issued warrants for angie's arrest and everything we had to sneak her out of japan So we put her on an unlikely flight that they weren't watching. I don't even remember where. It was somewhere strange where she then transferred to another flight back to America because they were going to lock her up for instigating a riot, which wrecked the theater. Lee was on the road at the time that David was writing new material that would end up on Diamond Dogs and got to hear some of those songs come to life. See, here's the thing. I was on... This was back in the mythical days when he would not take airplanes. And so he had to travel by uh, ground transportation. And so because I was the advance man, I had to go find the gay bars, check out the clubs, you know, and do the initial publicity and everything before the show arrived there. And I had plenty of time to do it because I'd fly in and the show would be chugging along in a bus or a train or whatever was on the ground. So sometimes I'd have like three days before they got there for me to do my advance work. So I didn't do much of the on the that kind of traveling with David because my job was to fly ahead. I only did the traveling with him once we went on the Trans-Siberian Express because that was my punishment. Occasionally you would get punished in Main Man just to keep you in your place. And so then they punished me by putting me on the Trans-Siberian Express, which was, of course, no punishment. We'd been in Japan and we had to get back to home, back to England with Jeff McCormick and a writer, Ed Musel. So we got on the Trans-Siberian Express, which took 10 days to get across Siberia, but we went across that. So that's probably the only time when I really did a lot of just on the ground level traveling with David, because I was mainly flying ahead of time. But he would, when we'd get there, he would often call me into his room and play me songs on his acoustic guitar and ask my opinion, which is, I don't know why he was asking that, because I had known nothing about music except just, you know, what I like, you know. But I heard like Rebel Rebel and Gene Genie in hotel rooms on an acoustic guitar. So I did get that privilege of hearing the songs first. 
Lee was at the Hammersmith Odeon the night that David killed off Ziggy and has some interesting insight into why David made that decision. Because there was more. And it's actually a good show business tradition that if you get a good stick, you know, some people will work it forever. England's a good example of that. Tommy Cooper and people like that. That's good. In America, we had Jimmy Durante and people, they'd work the same thing over and over. And that was good, and that's the way show business is. But with David, he could have worked Ziggy Stardust from then on. But he had other things. He had other ideas. He had things boiling within him that didn't work with that thing. And Ziggy Stardust did have its boundaries. If he was going to do certain music, certain approaches, certain ways of appearing on stage and dressing, he had to reinvent himself. And so once he started doing that, he realized that you could do that. And so then he just kept on doing it. I mean, it became a fixation for a while. You never knew what you were going to get. He had to actually kill Ziggy to get rid of it because it had become bigger than him. And he always had Ziggy. We've always had Ziggy. It's all there. It's on the records. They've never been out of print. But then he had to go on and do other stuff, because which Ziggy couldn't have done. A lot of those songs couldn't have been sung by him, all those heroes things. Because of his fascination with the underground art and music scene in New York, Lee enjoyed exploring the darker side of life in each city he visited on his travels. And as you've heard in earlier episodes, there are often interconnecting journeys in the music industry where people meet up under interesting circumstances. Here's a great story that Lee told about first meeting Freddie Beretti, who had become a very important part of the Ziggy creative team, designing and making some of Bowie's infamous Ziggy outfits. The first time I met him, I had heard about Piccadilly Circus and Dilly Boys. Well, Freddie was a Dilly Boy. So I would go down to Piccadilly Circus to look at the pretty boys who were there for sale. I've always been fascinated by rent boys. And I love that term. In America, we called them hustlers. In England, you call them rent boys. And Freddie was a rent boy, and he worked Piccadilly Circus, and he was so gorgeous. So I met him before I ever even knew that he had anything to do with David Bowie. In fact, probably before I even knew David Bowie. He didn't know anything about me. I didn't know anything about him, and his price was beyond. It was over my week's salary. But he was very charming. And then, actually, I didn't meet him again until David and Angie came to see Pork, and there he was. And we both recognized each other, and it was very hilarious. And we talked about it many, many times over the years then because, of course, he designed all of David's clothes. But more than that, he helped create the whole image and the whole myth of Ziggy Stardust as well. He was so influential. He was great. That's the wonderfully eccentric and talented Lee Black Childers from the Main Man Archive. There are some great pieces of rock memorabilia from Lee's adventures that are part of an ever-growing archive of Main Man documents, including articles, telexes, letters and production notes, a lot of them never seen before, that we are adding to the Main Man Label website each week. It's a great record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's at mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the Main Man series. I'm Des Shaw, and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening.